Today's lecture focuses in detail on the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and the distinctive legal doctrines that it has developed in its case law over the last two decades. We will analyze four distinctive doctrines in particular, the issue of remedies and reparations for human rights violations, the notion of continuing violations, the protection of indigenous communities, and the court's evolutionary interpretation of rights with a focus on the right to property. We will look at these doctrines in the context of a specific judgment of the court, Moiwana Village versus Suriname, which the court decided in 2005. Let's turn first to a discussion of reparations and remedies. Here you see an article of the American Convention on Human Rights that authorizes the court to award such remedies and reparations to victims. Here you see an example of the different kinds of remedies and reparations that the court has awarded. And it's quite an extensive list. It includes everything from compensation to enacting new domestic laws, revising existing laws, releasing victims from prison, exhuming bodies, public apologies, investigations and prosecutions, memorials, etc. It's fair to say that the Inter-American Convention is perhaps the most creative and expansive in its award of remedies as compared to any other human rights court or human rights commission at the regional level. Now what I'd like to do is analyze the reparations and remedies issues as well as the other distinctive doctrines of the court by having you review the case of Moiwana Village versus Suriname. That case is available on the course webpage once you've read through the excerpt of the decision, please continue the lecture. Let's first look at some of the allegations that are in the complaint. The case concerns the Njuka people, who are descendants of African slaves brought to South America, who in the 19th century escaped to the remote rainforests in the eastern part of Suriname and established their own autonomous society there. That society was largely cut off from the rest of the country and its inhabitants, and in part because of the African origins of the former slaves, and in part because of that isolation, they developed their own distinctive language, religion, and culture. In 1986, during the time of a civil war in Suriname, an army unit attacked the Moiwana village, which was one of the villages of the Njuka people, massacring more than 40 men, women, and children, destroying the village and forcing its inhabitants to flee where they remained for the next two decades. The case came to the Inter-American Court because it had first been heard by the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights and then referred to the court. Now, the response of the Surinamese government to the complaint was first to raise an objection to jurisdiction. And the objection was essentially as followed. Well, the massacre occurred in 1986. That was one year before Suriname had ratified the American Convention and recognized the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court. So Suriname is essentially arguing that putting to one side whether these allegations are true and whether they reveal a violation of international human rights law, they're outside the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court. And there actually is some considerable authority in international law for Suriname's position. Indeed, the general rule in international law is that an international court has no jurisdiction over events that occur prior to the state's acceptance of the court's authority or jurisdiction. That's the non-retroactivity principle. This general rule is subject to an exception, which is known as the continuing violations doctrine. And this doctrine says that if a human rights violation or a violation of international law in general began before the state had accepted the court's jurisdiction but continued thereafter, it might fall within the scope of the court's authority, notwithstanding that the entire series of events did not fall within the time period that the state had accepted the court's jurisdiction. So how does this doctrine apply in practice? Let me give you a few examples. So one question you might have is whether the doctrine applies to, for example, the murder by a state agent that occurs before the court 
before a country accepts the inter-American court's jurisdiction, but that causes, let's say, economic and, emotion and emotional harm to the victim's family after that date. And the inter-American court has considered that kind of question and has answered it in the negative. The court has distinguished between the act that violates the victim's rights and the subsequent consequences of that violation. Now, admittedly, there can be some uh, fine gradations here, but this is one way that the court has attempted to limit its own authority. Let's consider a slightly different example. The example concerns a so-called forced disappearance in which a victim, often a political opponent or dissident of a regime in power, vanishes prior to the state's acceptance of the court's jurisdiction, but whose whereabouts remain unknown and undisclosed thereafter. Here, the Inter-American Court has reached a different result, saying that the continuing violations doctrine does apply, and thus that the court does have jurisdiction because the violation is ongoing. The ongoing nature of the violation is the state's continuing to conceal the location of the victim or refusal to investigate his or her fate or whereabouts after the state has accepted the authority of the court. So how does this continuing violations doctrine play out in the context of the Moiwana village case? I think the way to see that is to look at the violations that the Inter-American Court found in this case. In particular, the court finds a violation of the right to humane treatment, the right to property, the right to movement and residence, and the right to effective judicial remedies. Now, you might notice that there is something missing here. After all, the complaint concerns an allegation of a massacre which involved the deaths of members of the village. So what is missing? Well, the right to life, which is certainly protected by the Inter-American Convention. Here you see the court taking the position that the right to life, that violation, which occurred as a result of the massacre, was a discrete event that happened prior to Suriname accepting the court's jurisdiction. However, there were other violations that continued after that date. So the inability of the residents to return to their land, their uh, inability to have control over the land as property, the inhumane treatment they experienced during their exile, and their inability to have an effective investigation and prosecution of those who were responsible. So this is how, in the Moiwana Village case, the Inter-American Court draws a line between those violations that are within its jurisdiction and those that are outside of it. Let's now turn to a discussion of the right to property, which is in Article 21 of the American Convention. I've put the right to property up on the slide for you to consider, and I'd like to discuss for a moment what issues the right of property raises in the context of an indigenous community. The answer to that question, what special rights of property arise for indigenous communities, is discussed in the court's judgment at paragraphs 131 through 133. The court says in particular that many indigenous communities have an all-encompassing relationship to their traditional lands and that that's the basis of their spiritual and cultural life and indeed their survival as an indigenous people. And in addition, the mere possession of land is sufficient to justify a claim for the government to provide official recognition and title of their communal ownership. Now, I do want to stress here that the court is adopting an evolution, evolutionary or evolutive or expansive interpretation of the right of property. Let's go back just for a moment to take a look at the text of that right. Notice that it is written as in the singular. Everyone has the right to the use and enjoyment of his, and I would say her, property. No one shall be deprived of his property except in the circumstances listed. That suggests that the right of property is an individual or private right, but the court, in its analysis of how this right applies to indigenous communities, recognizes communal or collective ownership. 
that's an example of an evolutive interpretation of human rights law, which we saw in the context of the European human rights system in earlier lectures. Now let's turn to a discussion of some of the remedies in the case. I've given you a list of the remedies, and this is a summary of those remedies awarded, which you read about in the excerpt of the Moiwana Village Judgment, and you'll see that the remedies are really quite expansive. They include not just compensatory and moral damages, but also an obligation to investigate the causes of the massacre and who's responsible, to prosecute and punish those responsible, to give the Moiwana Village title to their lands, to permit them to return under conditions that meet their uh, spiritual needs, to provide a public apology and acknowledgement, which by the way the government does in the context of the case itself, to erect a monument and to create a development fund. Here you see a plaque and a monument, a series of sculptures that were built to commemorate the 1986 massacre of the Moiwana village. I would like to conclude the lecture by talking a bit about some of the larger issues raised by the remedies and reparations awarded in the Moiwana village case. So the first is, are the nature, type, and scope of the remedies and reparations, are they appropriate? That is to say, does the Inter-American Court make the members of the Moiwana village and their families, the survivors of the massacre, whole by the remedies that it awards? And does it strike a proper balance between individual remedies, such as compensation, and collective remedies, such as the memorial and the development fund? I think you can ask this question from a variety of different perspectives. You can also ask whether it's appropriate for the state to take full responsibility for an activity which was in part outside the court's jurisdiction on the basis of when it occurred. These are issues that I invite you to discuss in the forums. Another question to consider about reparations and remedies is what's the court's objective? What is it trying to achieve? And I think one of those objectives is, as previously mentioned, to make victims whole. Another objective might be to provide the incentives for the government not to permit the violation to recur, uh, and also perhaps to find a way to integrate the indigenous communities into the life of the country on terms that allow them to continue their cultural, spiritual, and historical traditions. A final question concerns what challenges might arise during the implementation of these remedies. Consider, for example, the development fund that would be in place for a series of years. That fund is designated by the court as requiring both the participation of the government and the members of the community. That suggests that there would be an ongoing monitoring role for the Inter-American Court or some other external actor to ensure that the fund was being properly administered and that the views of the community were being properly considered. There's a question, you might say, about how the court would engage in that monitoring and supervision and whether that's a role that a regional human rights court ought to take on. I'll conclude the lecture now by giving you some additional sources that you might look at regarding the Inter-American Court's judgments and jurisprudence with respect to the rights of indigenous communities.